We're in part three of a series we've called Faceless. How many of you have been here, been here for Faceless series? You've been enjoying it so far? Yep. If you missed any of them, you can check them out online. This is actually a character study of the person of John the Baptist, who was very different, uh, very unique, and we're learning about his uniqueness. We're learning about how God like des- had a destiny for his life, an assignment, and how really he has a destiny and assignment for all of our lives, that all of us are different by design. I'm really excited about this topic, this theme we're drawing out of John the Baptist's life today because it's kind of like the anchor um, of his character. It's like what most of us know John the Baptist for, and I truly believe and I really hope that you're coming into God's presence today and approaching his word, believing that he can shift you. Do you believe that, you guys? You guys believe that God, every time like we open up his word, every time we open up our hearts to God, like he can shape and shift us. And I believe today that God wants to do that. There is this countercultural man who, who followed God, very, who was just wholeheartedly committed to God. And we can learn so much. The theme that, that we're going to be talking about today is humility. And this is what many people who know of John the Baptist know him for. They know him for his humility. And if anyone, though, had the opportunity or I don't know, more, more opportunities than the average guy to be prideful, it was John the Baptist. John the Baptist, no one else but Jesus himself, no one else can say um, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. From birth, he was filled with the Holy Spirit leaping in his mom's womb. Jesus himself testifies of John the Baptist that he was the greatest man to have ever lived in all of human history. Um, no, like he had these, a tremendous opportunity for pride to be developed in this guy's heart. So it, early on in his vocation, like his vocation was so successful. All of Jerusalem and Judea, crowds of throngs and thousands came out to hear and follow John to repent and be baptized. And here he is in his early 30s. So he has plenty of opportunity to get trapped by, by pride. Pride is... is one of the most deadly sins because it's, it is at the root of every sin that we, we can commit. Every, every sin, everything, everything at its root, is, it goes back to pride. Pride is, was actually Satan's original sin that we're, talk, that we're told in Isaiah chapter 14. Before Satan was known as Satan, he was a created angel in heaven by the name of Lucifer. And the Bible records this event that happened when pride was found in Lucifer's heart, where he said, I will be like the Most High God. Pride is what Satan tempted Eve with in the Garden of Eden when he said, hey, if you take of this forbidden fruit, you will be like God. Pride, it's, it's so destructive, and we're going to talk about that today. Pride was at the heart of the religious leaders of John's day and Jesus' day. It was a lot of the confrontations we see of Jesus and John the Baptist in the Bible with the religious leaders were because of their prideful, their prideful hearts. Here's a confrontation that John had, Matthew chapter 3. In your notes are up here. It says, When John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and that's just two different forms of religious leaders, two different sects of the religious leaders of the time, Pharisees and Sadducees, coming to where he was baptizing, He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So what he was saying was the fruit that's coming from your life, how you're treating people is different than what the God that you say you serve says to treat people. What's coming out of your mouth is different than what you say you're all about. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't think you can say to yourselves, and here's the pride, we have Abraham As our father, oh, this is where we come from. This is my name. This is my title. Oh, I'm a part of this church, or I've been a Christian for this long. He says, don't think you can hang your hat, and you can stand on any of that. You can say, Abraham's our father, because I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. There is nothing special about you that you can take pride in. So here's what I want to do today. I want to talk about the pride of the Pharisees, that every single, look, pride is... Every one of us deal with pride. We all, do, it, it is, it is um, kind of a human condition that we all have to deal with and address in one form or another. And, and 
John the Baptist, in John chapter 3, we're going to look at John chapter 3 and look at a portion of scripture where John himself had to be, he was tested with this, this, the same pride that the Pharisees were tested with and failed, and many of us get tested with in life. And I want you to pass the pride test and kind of take on, adopt this, this powerful characteristic, this trait of humility. I want to show you how, but first let me show you the pride of the Pharisees and how John was tempted with it. Take some notes with me, you guys. The first, the first pride was the pride of, of popularity, of popularity. So where maybe some of you are like, um, I don't really like, I don't need to be popular. That's not nothing that I deal with. But let me say, let me say it this way then. It's like the need to be liked, the need to be approved, to be affirmed, to, to, get, to get affirmation or value or be liked from people that you need that. And all of us, all of us are wired that way, by the way. We all need to be or want to be at least liked by people. We were wired by God, created for human relationship and human connection. And so when, when someone in our sphere of influence doesn't like us, whether you care to admit it or not, it hurts. It hurts when someone in our spheres doesn't, doesn't like us. But what you need to know is you cannot live for people's approval and you cannot make people like you. You can't. The truth of the matter is that everything that you and I do is either a bridge to some people and a barrier to others. Everything. So the clothes that you wear is either a bridge for some people or a barrier to others. Your personality is a bridge to some people and a barrier to others. Some people are drawn to you and others are just not. Right? They're just they're just not, okay? And so prideful people, what they do is they build bridges to themselves. Oh, I want you to like me. How can I make sure that this group likes me? I'm going to act like this and be like this with this person and this person. And, and it's a bridge to themselves while they build barriers to anyone who threatens their false sense of value. Well, John, though, in his humility, he didn't build bridges to himself. He didn't build his own platform. He wasn't building a bridge to himself in his own praise. He built a bridge to Jesus. And the only people that couldn't cross that bridge... We're the proud. This, this popularity trap. Look, John was tested with it. We're going to pick it up in verse 22. John chapter 3, 22. His own disciples, John's own disciples, kind of got succumbed by this pride trap. Jesus, it says, and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, this is after John the Baptist had baptized Jesus. It was, it was after this, this, that amazing moment where, where heaven opened up, the Father spoke, the dove, the dove descended. Okay, It was for a short period of time after that, Jesus was actually, he began his ministry on earth. Jesus was ministering, preaching the kingdom and baptizing with his disciples, and so was John. So it was, it was for a short period of time, they were both having ministry, even in the same area Okay, and it says, now John also was baptizing in Anon near Selim. And it says, because there, were pl there was plenty of water for everybody to be doing it, and people were coming and being baptized, and just for context, that it wants you to know that this was before John was put in prison. They were both ministering at the same time. And then an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing, baptism. Like, oh, which kind of baptism is this? And how should you baptize? And how are you made clean? And they came to John, it says, and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about when you said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Look, he's doing what you're doing, John. And, and, and everyone is going to him. John, he's taking our members. What are we going to do about this Jesus guy? who's still in our sheep and our, and our members. And here they were comparing their ministry and John's ministry with, with that of Jesus' ministry. And they were trapped by this pride now of comparison. And notice, notice the comparison of exaggeration to everyone. Everyone is, and they're just exaggerating now. Everyone is, is going over there and, and following Jesus. And what are we going to do about this Jesus guy? Comparison, listen, comparison is an act of violence toward the unique purpose that God has for your life. It's an act of violence towards it. Look, you, you will not be distracted by the comparison trap if you are consumed with your purpose. 
If you are caught up in your purpose, you won't get caught up in comparing or competing with others. So here these disciples of John are trying, they're competing and comparing and going, oh, what are we going to do about that? And John says, no, I'm caught up in who I'm called to be. I know my design. I know my destiny. I know my calzone is what we were talking about last week. I know my purpose and I'm caught up in who God has called me to be. I'm not going to be comparing with anyone else's ministry. He's not going to be distracted. Let me give you the response that John gave. Before I give you the feeling, let me give you the scripture there. John chapter 3, 27, that next verse, John replied to them and said, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Oh, don't you love that response? John shows them. I can, I can just picture him with his open hands like this, just going, I have nothing. I have, I, a person can only receive. Are, these people aren't mine. Nothing is mine. I, was, I don't own anything, John says. Nothing is mine. A person can only receive anything that is given to him from heaven. James would go on to say that every good and perfect gift comes down from God. You don't own anything. You are just a steward, not an owner. Only, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven, he says. Here's the second pride of the Pharisee. I want you to write down power. Because the Pharisees not only wanted to keep their popularity, and they saw John as a threat to that, but they wanted to hold the power of the people. They had a false sense of power. They didn't really understand where power comes from. Jesus says, my strength is perfected in your weakness. You see, the, the, the pathway to God's power is through your weakness, not your supposed strength. God called you not because of your power, your strength, or your intellect, but that he could be glorified in your weakness. So, so we can get all the, the pride of the Pharisee where we try to power grab and control people or control situations. Leviticus chapter 26, 19, the prophet prophesies God speaking on, to Israel, and he says this to Israel, I will break the pride of your power. And honestly, that needs to happen. And, and it needs to happen to every one of us. There, there are moments or seasons or things that we just get lost and caught up into, and we need God to break the pride of our power, which is a good, it's a good thing to be broken by God. Do you know this? Because you can't be blessed by God if you haven't been broken by God. Come on, somebody. Am I preaching tonight? Are you receiving this okay? You need, you, it's okay to get, to get the, the hand of breaking to be, pla- to be placed on you when you start putting your pride in yourself or your ego. Man, you need God to break that spirit off of us. Here's the third area of pride. The pride of the Pharisees is position. You ever, maybe, maybe this happened to you. I know what happened to me. You got, maybe you got your degree and you started walking and talking different or something. You started acting a little bit different. You got a position and you started, man, you started talking different to you. You thought you were something, you know, got a top, maybe you got a raise, you got a promotion, you got this position. This is something that most of us, most of us need to like learn this basic lesson and we need to relearn it and learn it and retaught it and taught it again, taught it again. Here's the basic lesson everyone need to relearn. God is God and I am not. Amen. That's the last, that like we have to remind, when things don't go the way that I want them to go or in the timeline I want them to go, I need to remind myself, I am not God. He is God and I am not. So John responds in verse 28 to these people, his own disciples. He says, you yourselves can testify. I've been saying this the whole time. I'm just the bridge to Jesus. I'm nobody. I don't, I don't own anything. You know I've been testifying this the whole time. I am not God. I am not the Messiah. This is so important. Humility stems from understanding who God is and who you're not. Humility stems from understanding who God is and who you are not. But I am sent ahead of him. Verse 29, it says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Talking about Jesus and the people. The people are his. The church is his. But the best man, John saying, I'm the best man. I rejoice when he, when he stands and hears the bridegroom's voice. How weird would it be? If the best man at a wedding demanded all the attention, how awkward would that be? If the best man was like, you know, forcing his way in the center of all the pictures, stood in front of the pastor, forced his way in there at the ceremony in front of the pastor, or cut the cake, took the first cut, took the first dance, you know what I mean? The first dance. How weird and awkward would that be? That'd be weird. You know why? Because that's not his place. 
One definition of humility is to know your place. Right. I think a lot of us, we, we, we're living like we're, we're the bridegroom and life's not about you. You're just the best man. You're just the maid of honor. Life is not about you you. The br- you're not supposed to be a bridge to yourself for yourself. It's not about your popularity. It's not about your position. It's not about power. It's not about your promotion. It's not about none of those prideful things. You are just a bridge. You're, you're the best man. It's not about you. And then he goes on to say one of the most powerful statements that John gives us about his character. And he says, he must increase while I must decrease. Can we say that out loud together? One, two, three. He must increase while I must decrease. As Jesus increases in your life, this is like a causality. This is a cause and effect. As Jesus increases, it's like the scale is tipped. More of Jesus in my life equals less of me. The more he increases, this is what must, that must, he must. And as he must increase, the cause is I must decrease. But the opposite, the opposite is also true. Where we, where we increase, I must increase. And what that, what's the causality there? He must decrease. And a lot of us are living our lives just caught up in, in just the system of our culture and the way things work and the way that we're taught, elevating self and by doing so, lowering God. And I think a lot of us don't even know we're doing it. We don't know that we're living this way and making choices in such a way that is pushing God out of our life, that it's lowering God because of the, just the choices that we're making and the bridges that are coming back to us for us, selfishness, egotistic, hedonistic, narcissistic society that we live in. Let me show you. This isn't in your notes, but when we elevate self, the causality is we lower God. We, when, we, when we elevate self, we lower God. How do we elevate self? We elevate self by self-adoring. We're self-adoring, like I need to feel good. I want to feel good about myself. Well, if I feel, if I feel good, I should do it. It's my feelings, and I want people to, feel, and I want people to, to like me and to, and, to, and to feel good about me. And, and the causality there of elevating self and self-adoring is that God doesn't love me. I need, to, I need to adore myself and to be led by my feelings because God's love is not enough for me. And maybe we didn't start out that way with the choices you were making, the decisions you were making, and being led by your feelings. But the causality was now you are living your life not believing, or at least his love is not, love, is not enough for you. Here's another way we elevate self, and that is by self-building. Self-building where, you know what, um, I can do it without God. I got this. If, if I have an emergency, God, I'll let you know. I'll let you know, okay? And that's, that's why when there's big disasters, like 9-11, when 9-11 happened, churches were full. Right. Disasters happen in disaster zones and other areas where there's that. Churches get full. If there's an emergency, I, okay, but I can do the rest of it. I, I can build my own life, and, and really the causality of lowering God, and that is God isn't for me. Because if we really believe that God is for me and he's working everything out for my good and his glory according to, to his purposes, then I wouldn't need to build my own life. I wouldn't need to control it. No. But we elevate self and we lower God. Here's another way. Self-indulging. Self-indulging where we're just living our life for our pleasures, for our appetites, for our, for our lust. I mean, I can do what I want. And the result of that is just God isn't enough for me. That's why. See, pride is at the heart of all of, all of this elevating self. Pride. See, you don't have, check this out, you don't have an addiction problem. You have a pride problem. You don't have an anger problem. You, ha- you don't have a pornography problem. You don't have, you don't have, a, you don't have a relationship problem. You don't have a self-image problem. You have a God-image problem. You have a pride now, I'm not saying, I'm not minimizing those things. Those things are realities that need to be dealt with. But at the heart of it, at the root of it there, we elevate self. And we push God's presence, his power. We lower God in doing so. All pride has its roots in sin. And the Bible says to clothe yourself with humility. You want to know why? Because humility is the dress code of heaven. Amen. Every one of us, we're going to be wearing humility. 
in heaven. So here, here's what I want to do. I want to give us five decisions today to make that will, that will produce more of him and less of me. How many want more of God in your life? Anyone want more of God in your life? Do you, okay, you know what you're saying. <laughs> when you say, I want more of him, what you're saying is, I want less of me. You, you cannot have more of God and more of me. You can't. It's, it, it, what, Jesus said it this way. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot. You either love the one and hate the other. Someone is something. Something's going to reign in your life. And if you want more of God, what you need to have, less of me. That's what you're saying when you say more of God. So let me give you, you know, all, I'm going to give you some choices here. I'm gonna, I wrote them down as choices, five choices to make because all in the Bible, there is not one time where we're told to pray for humility. We have no example or no command. Not, no one is praying for humility or we're not told to pray for humility because it's not something, it's not a gift that God gives. It's not something that God gives to people. It's a choice that we make. Humility is a choice. And I want to give you some choices today that you can, you can do this. You can, you, can, you can have more of him. And really that's all it is, is more of him, getting more of him in your life. And the causality of that is less of you. So here are the decisions, and we have to start here. Number one, very important. Number one is I will exalt God. Come on, say it with me. One, two, three. I will exalt God. This is so important. You see, humility does not begin with you lowering yourself. All right? And I know that sounds, you know, contra- like, wait, wait a minute. No, no, no. Humility does not begin with you. It doesn't. It can't. Humility does not begin with you doing anything for yourself. Humility begins with exalting God. And as I lift him high, as I see him as he truly is, that he is worthy of all honor, glory, adoration, praise, worship. He alone is all powerful, all knowing, almighty. As I exalt God, the only result is for me to bow. That's, that's all that is left as I see God, as I exalt God. I will exalt God. And not just one day a week. Right. Not just for one hour a week on a Sunday. Come on, I will exalt God. I will worship. I will magnify. Make him big. I'm going to make God big in my life. I'm going to make God big in my mind. I'm going to exalt God. More of him and less of me. Some of us, some of us give more exalting uh, and we give more praise to our sports teams than we do God. So, so you know, watching the television basketball game or, or, or football game or baseball game, those, those stadiums look more like the Psalms than some churches do. So the Psalms teach us how to worship, clapping of the hands, the raising of the voice, the shouting, the dancing, the, the making a joyful, all the... That's, that's the Psalms, you see that, and then some people get in the church and they're like, <laughs> praise God. Come on, you guys, if you want more of him and less of you, you got to break the spirit of pride off of your life and stop worrying about what other people are thinking, what other people are doing, and you just need to make a choice. I will exalt God, I will worship him. I will magnify him. He alone is worthy of my praise. And in doing so, he must increase and I must decrease. You have to start here. There's no other way for more of him and less of you. Psalm 145, verse 1 through 3. Some of your translations, this is the Passion Translation. Some of your translations begin. I love Psalm 145, Psalm of Worship. It starts off, it says, I will exalt the Lord. I love the Passion Translation. It says, my heart explodes with praise to you. As I see you as you truly are, my heart just explodes with praise now and forever. And because I exalt you and see you as you truly are, my heart bows in worship to you. My king and my God, every day, not just one day, this is a choice of more of him, less of me. Every day, I'm going to exalt you, God. I'm not going to do it just on church. I'm going to do it in my car. I'm going to do it at work. I'm going to live in such a way that is magnifying, that is exalting God. Every day, I will lift up my praise to your name with praises that will last throughout the eternity. And as you exalt God, listen, as you exalt God, there is no way you can exalt yourself. You can't. 
So it starts here. For If you want to live this way, if you want to have more of him and less of you, then you need to make the choice to exalt God. Here's the second choice we have to make, and that is I will acknowledge God. I will acknowledge, John says, a person can only receive what's been given to him from heaven. James says every good and perfect gift comes from God. I acknowledge, God, that everything good in my life comes from you. I didn't create it. I didn't earn it. I didn't make it. Everything good in my life is from you. The reason why I'm alive today, God, I acknowledge you for life today. The reason why I'm breathing breath today, God, I acknowledge you. The reason why I have the job that I have, that I have the skills that I have, I have the wife or the kids or everything I have, I acknowledge you. Everything good in my life is because of you. The reason why I'm on the stage today is because God, you are good. And you decided to just to choose a, a broken, addicted, dysfunctional family east side kid because he thought, there ain't no way he's going to get the glory. I'll put him over here. I'll get the glory from that guy. God is good. I acknowledge God. Everything good comes from God. And if you want more of him, and less of you, you need to start acknowledging God for it. You don't own anything. It is not yours. You are just a steward. I love the way that 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 puts it. What are you so puffed up about? What do you, you got nothing to peacock around here about. Who are, who are you? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, then what are you? Why are you acting like you did something special? Why are you acting like you are something special? Why act as though you have accomplished something on your own? More, look, more of him, less of me. Can, can I tell you something? When you live this way, like this way, more, you were made for this. It's a lie of the enemy where you say, oh, no, I got to look out for me. I got to elevate me. That's a lie. That is a highly pressured, highly stressful. You were not made for that life. You were made to exalt God. You were made to acknowledge God. You were made for more of him and less of you. And when you live that way, please hear me. Life is better. Amen. Life is better this way. And not only that, not only is life better, but you're better at life. Like, you're, like when you have more of him and less of you, life is better and you are better at life. You will be a better husband with more of him and less of you. You'll be a better wife. You'll be a better employee. You'll be a better employer. You'll be a better leader. You'll be a better follower. Life is better and you're better at life with more of him and less of me. Amen, church? Amen. I will exalt God. I will acknowledge God. God, and here's the third choice. If you want more of him and less of you, I will forgive as I am forgiven. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time with this one because to connect these dots for you. Because I think that a lot of us do not, don't connect forgiveness with humility. Or, or let me say it this way. A lot of us don't connect unforgiveness with pride. But, but in essence, what you are doing when you are holding on to unforgiveness, bitterness, and offenses what you are doing is elevating self and pushing God out of your life. You're elevating self and lowering God. I need to forgive as I am forgiven. Let me give you three reasons. Three reasons. Because unforgiveness makes me unfit, un unfit for worship. It makes unforgiveness in my heart makes me unfit for worship. You have the, the, the scripture in your notes, just the address. Let me give it to you up here. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 23, 24, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, if you're worshiping me, he says, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go. Say first go. First go and be reconciled to them and then come offer your gift. Look, unforgiveness makes me unfit. Worship is a fragrant offering to God. And, and when you come into God's presence with unforgiveness, let me say it this way, it stinks. It stinks. God is going, you need to get out of here with all that. I just, I can't even right now. I can't even. Go, go get out of here. Go reconcile. Go take yourself a bath. Go, go settle that. Reconcile and, and come back. I need to forgive because it makes me unfit for worship. Now, let me kind of 
not all, not all offenses and sins and issues need to be, con, you know, confronted. Not all of them, not all of them do. If you, if you have to confront every offense and every sin, you'd just be chasing fires and putting out fires your whole life, especially if you're married. You know what I'm saying? My, my wife, she had to confront me every time I did something like a knucklehead, man. We wouldn't, they're just, she just got to go, Lord Jesus, you know, okay? For God, help him. You know, I just forgive, I just choose to forgive him anyway, all right? That just happens, because why? Love covers, the Bible says, a multitude of sins. So, so not everything needs to be confronted, but love, love does cover, love covers some sins, but also love needs to uncover some sins as well. See, there are some offenses and things that we're holding on to in our heart, unforgiveness, that makes us, that causes us to be unfit for worship. It causes division and stench. It stinks up our worship, and we need to go take care of that. I, it, it, will, it will produce more of him and less of you when you go and be reconciled. Here's the other, the, another reason. Because not, for, not to forgive is to usurp divine authority. It is to undermine God's divine authority. When I am holding on to it, it's because I don't trust that God's going to take care of it. When God says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, do not take revenge. Don't take revenge in your mind, thinking about it. Don't take revenge in your heart, holding on to that bitterness. Don't take revenge by talking about them behind, your, behind their back, trying to, every, to get everybody to see them the way that you see them. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, that's me, God says. That's, that's my place. That's not your place. And when you operate like that, you're, you're walking in pride. You're elevating self, and you're pushing me out. That is my job. I will avenge says the Lord. Here's the third reason. Because offenses against me are actually allowed for my development. And when I hold on to that, I'm rejecting the development that God has intended by this issue or this trial. I'm elevating self and lowering God. James chapter 1, 2 and 3 says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, look what he says, of many kinds, all kinds of trials, because you know that the testing of your Faith. Well, that wasn't really a test of faith, Pastor Jason. That was just a you know, relationship. That was my boss. That was financial issue. That was, no, no. God says, no, I caused that. That trial, that test was on purpose. It was actually, yeah, that was connected to your faith because I wanted to produce something inside of you. I wanted to produce something, in, a perseverance inside of your faith. I will forgive as I am forgiven, produces more of him and less of me. Colossians 3.13 simply says it like this. Accept life and be most patient and tolerant with one another. Always ready to forgive if you have any, if you have a difference with anyone. Forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you. And, and I don't know about you, but I didn't deserve it. And I didn't ask for it. And so he says, if you want more of me in your life, you need to freely forgive others who don't deserve it, who didn't ask for it. You need to let them off the hook anyway. And when you do that, you're inviting more of God. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna make a choice that will cause you to walk in humility. You're, that's what you're doing. I will forgive as I'm forgiven. And he goes on to say, and above everything else, be truly loving for love is the golden chain of all the virtues which leads to the fourth choice that you need to make. More of him, less of me. I will love as I am loved. There's no way, honestly, that you can walk in humility, that you can have this characteristic if you aren't going to extend love as you have been loved. And if listen, if you love God most, you will love others best. All right? You want to be a better lover? You want to, you want to love your spouse better? You want to just walk in love better when you love God most. I promise you, you will love others best. John 15 and 12, Jesus gave this simple command. That's simple, but yet not so simple, right? Love each other as I have loved you. I was a model. I was an example for you. How I love, now you are to love in the same way. First Corinthians chapter 13 reminds us, love is patient, Love is kind, it doesn't envy, doesn't boast, is not proud, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. A few chapters later in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul simply states, do everything in love. So, so how's your love life? 
Is your love evidence that you're allowing Christ to become, to become greater and you to become less? See, if I'm honest with you, see, I'm, you guys, I, I need more of God and less of me. And just because I'm up here don't mean I'm any, any different. It's not like, oh, yeah, follow me, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, I need more of him and less of me. This is a hard choice sometimes. I don't love people always the way that God loved me. Case in point, last, just last week was driving. It's always driving, man, driving. I'm not a good driver. Lord needs to help me with this because I'm, I, I was driving. It's a, mind you, it's a 55-mile-per-hour zone, and the car in front of me is going 35 miles per hour. Some of you are feeling my pain right now. Come on. Some of you are stressed out just feeling that. Like, come on. And so I, I'm, I'm not happy or proud to say that in that moment I did not act, you know, and my thoughts and actions did not reveal that I had become less and he had become more in my life. Okay? It just, it's, it's I need, I, God, you need to help me. You become more and I become less. We are called to love as Jesus loved us. And he loved us unconditionally. And, and can, I, can I give you guys some liberty? Let me kind of give you some liberty in this a little bit. I think this is going to set some of you free, okay? Listen, the only way that you can truly love people the way that God has called you to love them is to love them at a distance, yes. okay? I want to help some of you out here, okay? Because some of you need, you, need, you need this. And I'm not talking about you need to do this with your spouse. You can't be like Pastor Jason said. You, know, you, added, <laughs> you go sleeping in the other room. Don't be lacking. That's not, don't do that. But you know who I'm talking about. There's some people that, that you know, in order, they don't, they don't bring out, you know, more of him. They, put, they tip the scale, man. They bring out the worst in you, okay? They draw it out just because of who they are or, or, they're, offend, or they're just so aggressive or abrasive. There are some people that you can only love them the way God wants you to love them by unfollowing them on Facebook. Come on, somebody. By just blocking, by, by just distancing there are some family members, come on somebody, hallelujah, I'm going to start speaking in tongues right now. There's some family members that you, need to, that you need to distance yourself a little bit from in order to love them the way that, the way that God wants you to love them. And, that's, and that is okay, all right, because the bottom, the bottom line, I need more of him Amen. and less of me. That's what I need. I need more of him and less of me. Here's the the last and final decision. Don't go just yet, though, because I want to have a few thoughts about this. I will serve as Jesus served. If I want more of him and less of me, then I need to, I need to be willing to serve like Jesus, like Jesus served. And he gave, this, gave us this ultimate example in John chapter 15. Jesus, you see the picture of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. He, he gathers his disciples together, and he takes out this water basin and this towel and the Son of God, he, he gets down on his knees, and, he wa- and then he says, I have set you an example. As I have served you, serve others. You guys, Jesus, the Son of God, the Most High King, the Lord of Lords, never placed himself above other people. Jesus loved to serve, and he washed feet, and he fed thousands, and he walked to visit and heal and the sick and the dead, and he stopped and healed the woman with the issue of blood, and he visited people that people rejected and spent time with people that nobody cared about. Jesus lived a life of humility. Jesus showed us that serving people and humility go hand in hand. And if I want more of him in my life and and less of me, if I want to tip the scale, man, and have this, this better life that I was made for and be better at life, Man, I need to serve like Jesus served. So Jesus says, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, he says, do, hey, just do, do as I do. I was an example for you. Hey, come. He said, come, follow, follow me. Come on, follow me. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to do this, you guys. Come and follow me. Can, don't, don't, uh, my burden is easy, he says, and my yoke is light. You think by doing it your way, elevating self, man, that's, that's so heavy. You weren't made for that yoke. You were made for that, that burden. Come follow me. Come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Do, do as I, as I do. The Son of Man did not come for people to serve him. He came to serve others and to give his life to save many people. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves. Notice the choice, right? 
Don't pray for humility. Don't cry. Don't cry out to God, help me become humble. No, 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 no. Make the choice. Make the choice to exalt God. Make the choice to make him big. Magnify him every day. See him as he is worthy of all honor, praise, and glory. Acknowledge God. Freely forgive. Freely love. Freely serve. Humble yourself before the Lord. And from that posture, God says, okay, I'll lift you up now. The literal of I'll lift you up is I will honor you. You, the God of all the universe, of all creation, of all power says, if you humble yourself, if you lift me up and humble yourself, I will honor, literally honor you and lift you up from that place. And so if you're here today and, and maybe the scales have tipped a little bit and you're living a self-focused life, a self-indulgent life, you're building bridges to yourself, for yourself, unto yourself, Or maybe you've never heard of living a God-first kind of life like this. Or maybe you have and you kind of just lost your way and the scales kind of tipped on you. Revelation chapter 2 verse 5 tells us exactly what to do. It's not in your notes up here on the screen. He says, consider how far. You thought you you were like doing yourself a favor by elevating yourself, demanding your way, controlling, growing in your own power, prestige, and position, and popularity. And you thought, no, 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 consider how far you have fallen. And he says, repent, change your mind and your direction. Repent and, and, and do the things that you did at first. You remember your first love. When you first met him, when you first knew Jesus, when you first encountered Jesus, remember how you saw him, how, how much you loved him, how much you, your heart broke for him, how much you didn't care about anything in this life, and you just wanted to shed it all, all for him. And remember your first love and come back to this place of humility, of exalting God and acknowledging God, more of him and less of you. It's what you were made for. It makes life better. And it makes you better at life. So can we we bow our heads and pray together?